Hey, what's going on, you guys? Today, I'm going to tell you about my experience as a Boeing employee. I'm going to give you a little background how I got into the industry, what I did within the company, and just kind of my overall experience. Now, this isn't going to be a giant, oh, smear the company because that's what's popular. Uh, but maybe you're looking to get into the industry. Maybe you're looking at different companies. Um, maybe you're even looking to get into the field itself and just kind of want to get a insider glimpse into it. Now, I'm not going to give you particular inside Boeing information. I mean, I don't really even had, I, it's not like I, I'm a former employee. It's not like I ever had access to anything that wasn't necessarily available to the public, but I'm just going to give you my personal experience and how I got to where I was at, why I'm not there anymore, and what it was like there. And you can take whatever info from that you want. Now, it's not all going to be roses and dandies and you know, like I said, it's not going to be a big giant drag Boeing fest, but um, I mean, there's reasons I'm not there anymore. Uh, with that, uh, I have no bad thoughts about myself and I enjoy being on Earth. So let's keep it. <laughs> so let's keep it moving. So my my father was actually a Boeing employee and the town I grew up right inside of Everett, Washington, which was at one point Boeing headquarters. And I always viewed the company kind of as the coal mine. And in, in my mind, it was always like, OK, it went, if you end up at Boeing, it means you never made it out of you never made it out of Everett because I would just see. I mean, most people would either, you know, like if you didn't go to college, you would end up going to Boeing and then uh, people would work there for. 30 years, retire and whatnot. But this is back when they still had pensions and it was unionized and all these things. But uh, so I got out of high school and I initially went to California to go be an audio engineer and go learn all that stuff and kind of work in the entertainment industry and all that kind of stuff. And then around 2013, I moved back to Washington. I moved back in with my dad and my, I was trying to pursue my music stuff. My dad was like, you need to go get yourself a job. So I went and just got a, a, a dumb retail sales job, right? Just to kind of keep my dad off my back. And I hated this job. I, it was just the worst thing ever, okay? And so what I did, I went and took classes for composite manufacturing because they're going to bring in the, the 777X wing. So I went to go do composite uh, manufacturing classes at this place called the Washington Aerospace Technical Research Center, or for short, the Water Center. Very great program, by the way. If you're in the Washington, if you're in the Puget Sound area, and you're looking to get into aviation, they teach all sorts, and this is not a plug by any means, but they teach like core core uh, aerospace classes, and then they teach different for structure mechanics, general mechanics, I believe. Like I said, I, I did the composites classes. Now, I never did work in composites. I've worked with composites, but I never actually worked professionally in a layup and with autoclaves and all that kind of stuff, stuff I went to school for. But it was something to put on my resume to show that any sort of aviation experience because I was trying to get out of the retail world if my, like my life depended on it. I could not handle that anymore. And so the quickest way out, which I saw, was getting into aviation because, like I said, that was like the big industry uh, in the area that I grew up with and what was familiar to me. I saw the life that it provided for my father. So I was like, all right, well, I can do this just to kind of pay the bills for now. So I ended up getting a job at uh, UTC Aerospace Systems, formerly Goodrich. Uh, I eventually got bought out by Rockwell Collins. And eventually, by the time I left, it was called Collins Aerospace. Now, this is where I learned just the basics of being a structure mechanic. By definition, you were an assembler there because it was a production line, but they taught you, uh, you know, drilling or reaming, different, you know, close hole tolerance type stuff, uh, countersinking, because I'd never really used any sort of tools before. I'd never really been a big work in the shop type guy or anything like that. So this was where I learned the basics. I learned the basics about... Um, manufacturing and aircraft terminology and all these things. We were building the cells for the 787. So most of the things I was doing, I, was, I didn't realize how spoiled I was. Besides being exposed to a bunch of chemicals all the time in the production environment from like composite inner barrels being drilled and they're just being composite dust flying around and all that, it was actually a pretty sweet gig. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out. COVID came around, layoffs happened and all those kind of things. So I, re I left around 2020 and some of the worst days I had while working at Collins were when the Boeing people were in the building and they were really turning up the heat kind of giving us unrealistic uh production deadlines 
I remember what winter of 2018, I believe it was, we worked two weeks of 12 hour shifts, including a eight hour on Saturday. Um, just cause we were trying to meet the, the seven, eight, seven production demands. And it, it was very, um, you know, and we're just making one. So every other supplier would have been under those same expectations. So you got to imagine all the different wheels moving, trying to get these parts put together, try to get, cause the actual Boeing factory, they don't do a bunch of, you know, they don't do any sort of, uh, manufacturing per se themselves. They just kind of assemble the final products. They get everything. They get the fuselages, they get the wings, they get the, they get everything else. And then they just kind of put it together and make it a plane at Boeing and install the avionics and, you know, have the electricians come in and structurally they kind of get all the parts. I don't know too much about like the electrical side and all that kind of stuff, but um, I'm not saying they don't do anything at Boeing, but most of the major assembly is finished in Boeing where most actual manufacturing is coming from uh, other suppliers. Now, Boeing would really ramp up the expectations of these suppliers. And I, I would see some quality issues nothing you know these these airplanes are engineered so meticulously right these are very 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 smart people you know i see people talking about oh i'm not going to get on a boeing airplane i'm not gonna you got to understand i don't know any other industry that is under as much scrutiny and rightfully so it's not like you know 300 people are going to fall out of the sky when a car breaks down but if you think about statistically how little happens to these planes and how much is going on and how much stress is under these planes. So how good a products Bo Boeing is actually building. And what people don't realize is Boeing is actually, you know, they're building even submarines and spacecraft and, uh, you know, I'm going to get more into this, but all the military aircraft, which is what I was working on, on the military side of, uh, Boeing aircraft, you know, Boeing does a lot of things. So when we look at just the seven, three sevens and the mishap, of this last regime of the top, top, top financial executives turning up these crazy deadlines to have all these quality slips. It's actually kind of funny because when I would watch the news and I saw the CEO and he said, yeah, we had quality slips. Then I'd hear like comedians and just people who aren't in the industry be like, quality slips. It's like, yeah, well, that's more like quality escapes. Like that's, <laughs> that's what we call them as a quality escape when something slipped through the cracks, which it's bound to happen. You know, I always, I always had a level of empathy for the inspectors because for me, I, I was a structure mechanic and there's so many different levels. I mean, let alone within the Boeing system, you're level one, two, three, whatever structure mechanic. And you keep learning more and more skills and they keep getting more intricate because it, these are just incredible machines and they got to be structurally sound, right? So this is just one job is, you know, the structure mechanic and you get a quality inspector who has to check the electrical systems. They have to check the structural components. They have to check just like the general mechanics, the hydraulic type of stuff. They need to buy off the avionics. The, they're buying, they're proofing everything. Okay. And most of the time they don't, I don't know. I shouldn't say that, but it's very hard to put that amount of pressure on just one group of people. And then the worst thing that I saw was punishing people would be scared to raise their hands if they would make a mistake because if they would make a mistake they would get punished for doing that and that's something that has really started to change that's something that's really where the employees have spoken back against the companies that they've really started to change where um you know that that system of fear has really gone away and boeing's really taken the initiative to to, to say hey don't don't be afraid unless you maliciously you know go take a drill bit and scratch the side of the airplane like the pilot cheated on you or something like that you're not necessarily going to get in a lot of trouble unless it becomes like a persistent thing but that's also very dependent on the program like so i'm going to get more into you know this kind of just like a, a general broad thing and the mission that the company had dished out while i was there saying we really want you guys to speak up about defects and not be afraid to say that you did something wrong versus trying to hide it and get in trouble so i will give them that so anyways, so I worked at Collins for four or five years, whatnot, and then I moved to Austin, Texas to pursue some other things, and I needed a job. So I know aviation, and I knew in San Antonio they have a, a overhaul Boeing site where they overhaul military aircraft, such as the C-17, 
That's where the new VC25B is being built, where the VC25A is being maintained. They get rotated in and out. F16 programs, F15 programs, um, 16 and 15. I don't know if I said that right. Uh, and also the E4B is there, which if you're not familiar with the E4B, that's the first plane I worked on for Boeing, which they call it the Doomsday Airplane. It's a very cool plane because everything on it is analog. Um, the idea of the airplane, from my understanding, is if, if there were a nuclear blast, there's four of them, and one of them is always traveling with Air Force One. And so the president and high command can be on this airplane and they can stay in the air for two weeks or something like that. I forget. It's been a little over a year since I worked on that plane. And so that was a cool experience getting to be around that plane. But um, this is where this is where I was first exposed to the Boeing bureaucracy, because like I said, I always avoided Boeing. I didn't want to work there because I didn't want to too much follow in my father's footsteps. I kind of wanted to make my own path. That's why I never made the leap while I was in Everett and I stayed with Collins until I got laid off. Uh, but so when I went to San Antonio, I decided to get on with Boeing. Um, and I was very, you know, I had some really good experience and I had some very just head scratching moments. Like my first couple of days of training, you know, I had to be there at six in the morning for, for an orientation. And I really had, well, I got my, let's, let's back up a little bit. So I went to a hiring event in San Antonio for the building of the new VC 25 B. They were looking for structure mechanics. And so I initially, I tried to get hired on as a contractor through a temp house and I did not get hired, but then I applied through Boeing direct and I got hired on the spot, which is a very uncommon thing. Typically come in, people come through as a contractor. Then if you do well, you get hired on direct. So I was hired on direct, but at the time I only had like four and a half years experience or something like that. And they wanted five years experience for the for the level two that it was required for the people that they were hiring but i went to a hiring event i went to a hiring event and they offered me the job that bug is going to drive me crazy they offered me the job on the spot and they said well we're going to bump you up to a level two so they made me at the interview they made me reapply and go through the system and send in a new application they said, okay well we're gonna and they gave me a job offer they gave me a salary offer all that kind of stuff right on the spot now, this was in June of 2022. It was in June when I got my offer letter. Um, I accepted. They said, okay, well, we're going to send you a couple things. I got to do a higher right background check and all those kind of things and get clearance and all that kind of stuff. And that took about six months. So from the time I got offered the job to when I actually started, it was it was like end of June, maybe beginning of July when I got my offer. And then I didn't start until January 13th of 2023. That's when I started finally. And so I was hired to be a structure mechanic where if you know, so like I said, that's structural things like shooting rivets and working on kind of the skeleton of the plane, anything, anything skin, skin and uh, frame related. That's what I would work on on the plane. That's my trade. That's what I know. I went through two months of training and I was actually the only person that went through my training class all the way with, without having to retake anything. And then out of my whole training group, everybody else, they went to the VC 25 B to go do structure work. And I got put on the E four B to go and do interiors. Now that was just a very head scratching thing for me because the VC 25, if you've looked in the news or anything like that, Production is so far back on that plane. They are so off schedule and there's so many things wrong with that plane. And I came in obviously with, I mean, I'm not the greatest mechanic in the world, but compared to the class that I was in, I exceeded all of them and they got to go do big boy work. And then I got to go, I got sent to go do interiors. Now interiors is boring. It sounds exactly what it is. You're just taking out cabinets and just basically doing like general mechanic type stuff. It's kind of where, the joke was always E4B is where structure mechanics go to die. And so I worked there for about six months and I just, I, I just could not do it. And Boeing policy is that you have to work a particular job for one year before you can transfer. Unless you apply for a promotion. If you get a promotion, if you go level up, you can kind of skip that. But to make any sort of unilateral move, 
you have to be within your same job code for a year. And I had a very good relationship with my manager. That's one thing my, my first line managers that I had at Boeing were always really good guys. And I think the managers at Boeing, they always kind of get a bad rep from the, from the worker bees uh, because in their eyes, the, the managers look like part of the establishment. But if you really think about how big of a company and how much money and how much bureaucracy it is, the managers are really just peons. They really don't have a lot of control over anything. And um, I'm pretty sure if you were to ask a manager that, a first line manager, they wouldn't necessarily disagree. Maybe their ego would say, oh, no, I'm a manager. But they know, I mean, they're just kind of in between the lizard people making the decisions and the people actually doing the work. You could got a first line manager in there and they're kind of getting blowback from all angles. I would probably say that's probably the toughest job uh, in a first line manager just because you're dealing with it from every direction. And then the people below you a lot of times don't understand the limitations that you have and what your actual role is in the company. So I was always very fortunate to have good managers and maybe they treated me well because I gave off the impression that I understood that, you know, that they have a certain job to do and I shouldn't try to make their lives harder. Um, but the thing is, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the greatest mechanic. I'm not that, I'm not very mechanically inclined. I was very good at Collins because I was doing repetitive things. And once I learned it, I knew how to do it and I could apply those skills across many things. And that's typically how it is as a structure mechanic in general. You can apply those same skills across the board. It doesn't matter what part of the airplane you're actually working on. That's why I got really tired of doing interior work. It was just not challenging. It was boring. And honestly, it was kind of scary because I wasn't, I didn't feel like I had adequate training to be doing a lot of things that I was doing, especially, you know, if, you, if you're going to say, okay, well, you're going to go do interiors now. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm out on the flight line on a pad on a cherry picker on the side of a 747 in the wind and I'm asking electricians like, Hey, is this like, or installing some sort of communications tower. And I'm like asking the electricians like, Hey, are these wires? How they like, Oh, I don't know. That always really scared me. Like there was this one time I was supposed to reinstall this, this compressed air chamber on the top. If you know, the 747, the, 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 the top little hump section there, there's an escape door and there's an escape slide. So, you know, when the, when the slide pops out, so there's this air compressor tank that goes in there. And the only thing holding this air compressor tank is this like pin. And this kind of looks like a hand grenade. It looks like a giant hand grenade, to be honest. And I had installed this thing back into this cradle and it was extremely difficult. And there was no, all they give you is like a little illustration and then I made a joke. So we went for, and I was dealing with this all day and I went to lunch and I saw some friends and I was like, man, I'm really scared putting in this escape door slide pressure tank thing. They're like, oh yeah, some guy got killed doing that up in Everett. <laughs> I was like, okie dokie, you know, cause I was the new guy. So I was getting all the shit jobs. And, uh, and that was just one of the many things where I was like, okay, I don't feel safe here. That was one of the things like I never quite felt, um, because I think a lot of, so like HR, for instance, a lot of, a lot of the HR stuff, I, I, I feel like they would just, they would see on an application, they would see on a resume, oh, mechanic, but they wouldn't understand, okay, there's a difference between a general mechanic and a structure mechanic and an electrician and blah, blah, blah. They would just assume these people like, oh, you're a mechanic, you know how to do everything, but that's silly. It's like saying, you know, it's like you wouldn't go tell the plumber to go, uh, to go fix the drywall, you know, if you've ever worked in construction or something like that. And I think a lot of like the Boeing bureaucracy, a lot of the office people who end up assigning you, uh, you know, assigning you where you're going to go, they don't look at it like that. They just think, oh, he's a mechanic. He would touch labor. He can do anything on the plane, which is not the case because it was very surprising me because I don't have an ego about these things because, you know, I was very big on safety. I don't want ever, I don't want any, anything to ever go wrong with one of these aircraft in general and especially have it come back to me in any way and or even you know what i mean like i was always very careful to do things by the book and how you're supposed to do them and i'll try to ask for as much help as i possibly could and then i just kind of kept noticing that nobody really knew what was going on and i know that might sound scary to people um but it was just kind of a culture of like we'll figure it out nobody's here to hold your hand and i don't know if this was specifically at the san antonio boeing because, um, you know, at least half, 
probably more than that because these are all, like I said, the C-17s, F-15s, uh, F-16s, Japan AWACS. Um, I guess they did like 787 uh, maintenance, docking. Um, but for the most part, these are military airplanes getting overhauled. So obviously they're going to hire former military guys. I got kind of lucky that I later on worked on F-15s without prior military experience, but we're going to get more into that experience here in a minute. Um, but yeah, I just kind of noticed that most, you know, you would ask people every, it was kind of a culture of, there was almost too much military. There's almost too much military infused into the culture there of just shut up and do what you're told and don't ask questions. Well, I think it's a more healthier environment judging, you know, based off the products that we're building and maintaining that. Okay. Maybe if you don't understand, you should probably get clarification before you do something. Um, but that's just my opinion, you know, and I think maybe I have stronger opinions about that because I'm not the type of guy like at my house, I don't own a single tool at my house. For me, the Boeing thing was a job. A lot of people love it. They love being around airplanes. They love working with their hands. To me, it was strictly a job to buy this $2,000 camera that you're looking at me through to have this $2,000 MacBook to have this thousand dollar phone, you know, it's, it's a way for me to get things so I can do the things I'm care about. I never had real, real, real passion for the job. Um, which I don't think a lot of people do in general, but I was always very, I never had an ego. It's not like I wasn't passionate about my work. I would care about my work probably more than the average person, but I didn't have ego about it. And I wasn't afraid to ask questions but I found a lot of times I wasn't able to get those questions answered. And there is definitely an element of like, okay, well, we're not children. This is, we're all professionals here. Go and figure it out. The information is somewhere to be found in a manual. And that kind of led me to where I started really having problems with the planners. Because where I came from, from Collins, it was like, if you were, if you were assigned a job, you would get the paperwork and the paperwork would tell you, this is the fastener you're using. This is the size of the hole. This is the material you're drilling. You're going to do it. Uh, you're going to use this solvent. They would tell you, like the engineers and the planners, they would tell you exactly what you need to do. Now, when I got to Boeing, it was a completely different story. They would just say, do this job per this TO, per this technical order. And so you would go into the technical order and they would tell you, you know, a lot of times you would spend, it would take so long to get a single job done because you would spend hours on the computer just figuring out what fastener you're supposed to use or what this and that. So in my mind, it was like, okay, well, what are the planners doing? What are the, so as the mechanic, I have to put together all the paperwork and then I have to actually go do the job. I have to inspect the job, make sure it's flawless, and then put it, 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 it was, it was just insane to me, the expectation of the mechanic here in in San Antonio. I could just never wrap my head around how it reminded me of kind of like the IRS and paying taxes. I always kind of make this joke because if you did something wrong, like if quality came and they found something that you did wrong, it's like, you know, everybody's looking at you like you're crazy, like you're the dumbest person in the world. And then as, so it's like they, they know what you, how they want it done, but they don't tell you how that you want it done. But then if you do it wrong, you end up getting in a lot of trouble which I mean, sure, it's an expensive product, but it's like, why don't we take the time and have the planners actually sift through all this information? Because it's just pages and pages and pages. And then we have management asking us, okay, when's this job going to get done? And you're like, well, I'm still trying to find these specs versus just give you know, they would give you a job card, right? They would give you a job card. It would have like six steps, for instance. And I would say, um, put this piece on according to this, this document. Then you go to that document and it literally has thousands of pages. And so it's just literally a lot of it's tribal knowledge. A lot of it is just passed down tribal knowledge. Like I always had this joke where you just go find the oldest, crankiest guy you can find and he'll probably point you in the right direction because you're not going to get any information from any sort of like manager or planner or anything like that. Everybody, it's just kind of a go figure it out type culture, which never really sat quite right with me. So after... So after I, I quit Boeing work on because I couldn't handle working on E4B for six for six more months. I was like, there's there's too much opportunity in this world. I'm gonna go do some other things. 
So I quit and I went on a huge road trip through a bunch, bunch of places, did some other stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, around in December of 2023, I was like, you know what, I, I could actually go pick up like a Boeing contract, put some money away. And my plan was to go work at Boeing for a year. Just kind of stash some money away because contractor pay is very good. You don't get the benefits, but contractor pay is more money. And kind of getting hired as a contractor is actually a lot easier. And so I talked to a buddy. I'd ask him how things were on the VC, VC25B because they were hiring contractors and those jobs are typically like 50 an hour. And um, he's telling me, well, hey, we just, you know, I'm on this F-15 program. We're looking for F-15 mechanics. You should come over here. I was like, well, I have no experience with F-15, but that'd be cool. I've, I've always been into fighter jets. Fighter jets are sick. I'll go do that. And I pretty much had an interview. And I think because I'd already been a prior Boeing employee and I had good test scores and I had good, you know, when you look at my file, it was squeaky clean so i just had, I had one five minute phone call and i got a start date this time so this time was very easy but i wasn't a direct employee because i think they're quicker to bring in contractors because they can just get rid of them if it doesn't work out and that makes sense to me that's how i would hire so i have no beef with that um i just wish that when i did get hired as a direct employee they would have sped up the process because of those six months where i was waiting on my start date uh should have been a huge red flag about just like the withering bureaucracy of Boeing. Um, so, so again, I, I get hired at Boeing. I start in January of 2024 again, and I got to go through all the training all over again, about two and a half months. But this time they don't, they, they don't put me in this class, which is called drilling for quality, which is like a whole lab for like a whole month where you just do all the different drilling and reading blueprints and doing all these things. And I hadn't done this because when I did it before, I did it before, but they went and sent me on a program where I wasn't being a structure mechanic. I was doing interior. So I hadn't seen any of that stuff in a good year. I hadn't touched a drill or a rivet gun or any of these, these things, but they're like, oh yeah, you already did that. You don't need to do that. So for the two months, the two months that I was supposed to be in training, there was a good month where I literally did nothing. And when I say I did nothing, I literally sat in front of it like did they had called w, wbts or something web-based trainings i did a couple of those but besides that i just sat on my phone and it's not like i could it's not like i was being lazy there just was nothing to do and you had to be careful by saying hey i have nothing to do where they would have just sent you home with no pay obviously because your start date to hit the floor was in february or uh, yeah in, in may or whatever and uh, so, I, yeah, I really had no, I, I had these classroom trainings and, and just none of these trainings pertain to anything that I was doing. It was just so much bullshit. <laughs> it was just so much just BS that had no pertinence to anything that I was actually doing because the training department is in St. Louis and then they're telling the San Antonio MRO site how they should be hiring people but that's the real world. And then all these trainings have nothing to do with it. So I went through two months of just Boeing training. Then I went over to the F-15 program and nothing that I learned in training was transferable to this F-15 program because now we're working everything off Air Force specs, Air Force technical orders, Air Force everything. None of it was Boeing related. Nobody had ever taught me any of that stuff. And like I said, the whole, and the whole mentality when I got over there is because they had made so many mistakes before I'd gotten there where there was just a zero tolerance from upper management about any sort of defects. Like, and, and that's, a, I get that in a perfect world, nobody would make any mistakes, right? But that's like yelling at your football team, like, oh, somebody, obviously you want your receivers to catch the ball, but it's like, if they caught it all the time, or if they ran the play perfectly every time, we would never practice. We would win every game. And so it was like, I just walked into this just absolute, just wound up fear-based culture and where nobody really taught me anything. And the planning, a typical Boeing blueprint that you would get, it would basically have a very clear indicator of the size of hole that you would drill, the size fastener you would use and the length of it. This program that I went into, they use these things called a RIDS. I don't know what that even stands for, but that's not what it was. It would just show... God, I don't even remember what it would show. It was not very apparent. You would have to use a whole like legend to figure out what size the hole would even be or what's, or no, just, it would just tell you like, I, I don't even remember what it was. It was so, it was so 
they made it so incredibly difficult. Like I said, I would spend hours, everybody would just spend hours on the computer just trying to unwind what the hell these planners were putting um, were putting in the paperwork because nobody had any idea what the frick was going on. Um, but yeah, to say the least, I mean, it just, it just didn't work out because I, I kept making mistakes that I think would have been preventable if, you know, I, I don't like putting blame on anybody but myself, but I, I did not feel like I was in an, in an environment where I, I felt, I felt, I, I felt like nobody trusted me for one because nobody wanted me to touch anything. And then when I would touch something, I was supposed to just go from zero to a hundred and just know what, what, I, like, it's like, I go to the floor and then they just start giving you these real shit jaws because you're the new guy and you don't get to train or shadow with somebody that knows what they're doing and learn from them. And then all of a sudden you get, okay, well, you've done these shit jobs. You've been here. Now go do these real jobs. And then you have no idea how to interpret the paperwork or, and it's crazy because I would always feel stupid. I'd always feel so stupid. I'm like, man, I, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. And I'd ask somebody, I'd ask somebody for help. And they'd be like, oh, I don't know. And nobody ever knew anything. So I don't know how anything would ever get done. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, like I said, man, Boeing... Boeing is a great company and I think they've really made strides. I think they've really made strides to try to fix the things that are wrong over there. Um, especially in the production environment, from what I understand, because I would get all the emails from the commercial side where they'd be like, you know, speak up. But where I was involved in on the military side, there was zero tolerance for, I mean, there, there was just no, there was no guidance, there was no relevant training, and there was no, uh, you know, they would like to say these things, they would like to come out and be like, oh, you know, raise your hand, blah, blah, blah. But then when you would, when you would speak up about something, there was just this, they're like, we can't have any, well, yeah, no shit, we can't have defects, right? Of course we don't have defects, where in the real world, things go wrong, and then when they go wrong, we deal with them. And then if we have people doing things wrong too many times, different people making the same mistake over and over, maybe we shouldn't blame the people, we should blame the process. And that's what I feel like was never happening at Boeing. I felt like we would never, we would never look at process, we would only look at people. Whenever something went wrong, we wouldn't try to be like, well, what, what, what were the factors? It'd always be human factors. That's a term they use, like, well, human factor. Well, yeah, this guy drilled a hole in the wrong place, but why have four other people done it? Maybe there's something wrong with the planning, right? If we got two, three people making the same mistake over and over again, maybe we should be like, oh, we keep hiring idiots. Maybe we should be like, well, maybe idiots are doing the hiring, you know? But I don't know. That's beyond the point. But uh, yeah, if you guys want any more info, um, just let me know. I'd be happy to tell you if you want any sort of whatever you may need. I'd be happy to provide some more information. So uh, please like the video, sub to the channel, and I'll see you all for the next one.